Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is our special post-election episode, election 2016. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me is my, my, uh, I don't know, uh, this is a Muslim show, but he's kind of my drinking buddy for this episode, Pervez Ahmed. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, or, or perhaps smoking buddy, because we did, after all, legalize marijuana, um, you know this. Uh, you know this last election. So there you go. So what's the what's the fic position on marijuana? <laughs> I know, right? I've been, it's funny you ask that because it, I we I got into this like again hypothetical conversation with someone who's who's a little bit more learned than me, uh, or a lot more learned than me in Islamic law, and I was just like, is there any like dispensation out there position out there you know that 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 justifies hashish and um, uh you know or I, I i said hashish deliberately because you know uh yes in fact classical islamic jurisprudence has talked about the issue of hashish smoking um and uh minus uh, really out there sort of you know um Abo- uh, what's the word not not abhorrent uh but uh you know just isolated uh, opinions on the overwhelming majority of scholars consider it to be absolutely forbidden. So, too bad, man, because I felt like there was something almost, yeah, there was something, not almost, there was something very timely about the passing of, what we're referring to here, guys, is is for those who don't live in California or may not be aware, California just legalized recreational marijuana, joining, I think, what, four other states and D.C., um, and so um, I think given the outcome of the presidential election, um, it couldn't have come at a better time, I think, for a lot of people. <laughs> That's true. In California, at least. <laughs> yeah. In California. And yeah. and let's not bury the lead. So this is, this is uh, November 10th, so three days, uh, two days after the presidential election, which saw Donald Trump elevated to the most powerful political position on the planet. Wow. I mean, I there's been so many surreal moments in the last 48 hours. Uh, and, and so and they still remain, at least to me. I don't know. And I'm sure we'll get to the Zucky in terms of how wh- what you feel right now, mm-hmm. right here, right now. But I mean, there's just so much of it is still surreal. Like every time I hear president elect Donald Trump or I see it on the news, it, it's for me, it's still surreal. Uh, I was at the gym earlier today, and they were showing, you know, clips from the meeting with President Obama, and again, surreal. Yeah, you know? it's almost, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I know, I, I know, uh, surrealism is not <laughs> one. It's not a phase of this. Is not a phase of uh, of grief, but uh, you know, I, I'm in that phase where, yeah, it's still. I guess that's denial, perhaps, but uh, it just seems so surreal. Yeah, it's it's uh, you know it's it's one of those things where you have to process it. I mean, I, I, as yeah. I'm talking to you, I just got uh, done with uh, a, a speech class that I taught earlier today, and it kind of became unpacking the election. And you know, really, just what I tried to do was just hear everybody's perspectives, and you know, really, the the sense of sadness and confusion and fear yeah. that is there among among minority communities people of color uh lgbt community i mean it's it's real and it's not something that can be uh, sort of dismissed i mean i i I, it, I became very profoundly aware of that just talking to my students and and more than anything the sense of un, unease of not knowing what's next was what was really you know, sort of uh, hanging around their necks. Yeah, I mean... You know, I I didn't have any good answers to give. I mean, all I said was, um, you know, we we need to get activated. I mean, if... if, I mean, the system is us. We are the system. And 
if it's moving in directions that that we're uh, unhappy with. I mean, the same way, in many ways, the Trump election was the opposite and inverse of the the Barack Obama election. Correct. In, in many ways, I mean, I mean, the the Trump coalition is the inverse and opposite of the Obama coalition. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so one election was a response to the uh, one presidency is a response to the, the uh, another presidency. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I remember this was something that we discussed on our episode with Shadi Hamid. Um, you know, when I asked him if he he thought that the that the uh, that this election or I'm sorry, at that time, of course, it was is Donald Trump's popularity again, mind you, this was two weeks ago. Donald Trump's popularity, uh, a, 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 a symptom of or a reaction to, excuse me, you know, eight years of Obama. And, and, and he, you know, he, he didn't feel like it was a direct corollary. Uh, and I'm not saying that there's causation there, but I think that 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 uh, a, a now a Donald Trump presidency cannot be seen in a vacuum. And 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 the context or one of the contexts of that is an Obama uh, is eight years of Obama. But let me ask you, and I don't think this is what you meant, but what if it is a reaction to eight years of Obama? What is it a reaction to? Um, because again, my question at the time to Shadi was a bit loaded, was because I was referring to: is this a response to America's first black president? Well, I I, I don't think that is entirely what it is. I mean, yeah, it's, I'm glad. Okay, good. It, Cause I, yeah. Cause obviously a lot of pundits, right? I mean, we're all, we're, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're still on that armchair, you know, Wednesday morning, in this case, Thursday, Friday, now, whatever, you know, people armchair quor- quarterbacking this thing. And, and, you know, I think they're the, the initial, oh, this was, you know, America chose racism and hatred over, you know, love or whatever may be the case. That narrative has, is dying out and people, are seeing that the polls just don't show that the turnout just it doesn't show that you can rest this entirely on racism. Yeah, and, and so so first of all, point number one, racism absolutely played a role in this. Let's not deny yeah. that. Absolutely. So so we need. I mean that that's you know it, it it's there. We need to thread the needle here. Correct. A portion of Donald Trump's vote is racist is nativist is sexist is xenophobic is is anti lgbt that is fact that's that's undeniable that's right. it, it, controvertible fact that's that's yeah. baked into the cake now that being said i mean w- w- all of politics is personal and for for a big chunk of the uh, you know the the country that voted for Donald Trump, and specifically, I don't mean the traditional Republican states. I mean the states that ultimately gave him the election, and and that's basically the Rust Belt, that's the Great Lakes right. states, that's Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, uh, uh, Pennsylvania. I mean these these are manufacturing states that he he spoke to, and and he. You know, he he spoke to their needs in a way that they did not feel had been addressed by either either of the previous presidencies. So Barack Obama and George W. Bush and the, their their feelings were not taken into account, you know, by by the Clinton campaign, you know, because because it was sort of taken as a given that these were traditional blue states and as is being when you look at the data and this is something that Michael Moore of all people sounded the alarm bells about many, many months yeah, ago. Wow. Uh, and yep. he, he called it precisely, um, you know, th- these were people who felt disenfranchised who wanted to blow up the system. And I don't mean that, I don't mean uh, blow up literally, but I mean, they, they, they were in a position where they said this party and this party has not done anything for me. So here's sort of an outside actor. And, uh, you know, uh, Michael Moore referred to it as the Jesse Ventura effect, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. you know, which of course he's talking about when Jesse Ventura wrestler, pro wrestler, Jesse Ventura was elected governor of Minnesota kind of for the novelty of it. Well, th- that's what we saw here. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure by now most of our listeners have have uh, either seen uh, or read Michael Moore's uh, very now uh, 
prophetic, prescient sort of uh, analysis uh, months ago in terms of like five reasons why Donald Trump would win the election. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, if, if you see, I, I've only seen segments of it, but uh, you know, his documentary that he released again a few weeks ago, uh, Trump Land, uh, where he where he goes into this and yeah. precisely what you're saying. I mean, it was essentially a chunk of the electorate giving a, gi- a, a gigantic middle finger, you know, a proverbial F you to uh, to the establishment. The system. To, to this system, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, um, no, no. But, uh, the, I mean, yeah, the... and I think you're also. I think what's also telling. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I mean, I think just some data to, to, to kind of like to, to kind of back it back up or substantiate what we're saying. You know, 29 percent of Latinos voted for Trump. I mean, that's that that's remarkable, right there. I mean, that that number to me is is very very telling. Uh, like it just you know. There was that ubiquitous narrative that Trump would have problems with the, with that particular demographic, um, but he didn't. Uh, in fact, he did better. He fared better uh, in the in the, with the Latino vote, and interestingly enough, with the African American vote than Mitt Romney did in 2012. Yeah. You know, and uh, and conversely, conversely. Women just didn't come out. Women and minorities, I, sh- I should say. So, women, uh, black, you know, black voters, uh, Latino voters, just didn't come out in the droves and in the numbers that that that, that I guess the Clinton campaign was 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 banking on. Right. You know, and and a last sort of what I found to be a very interesting statistic was you, you mentioned Wisconsin, and you're absolutely right in focusing on the Rust Belt states. You know, 61% of Wisconsinites had a negative, had a less, you know, what is it, uh, an an unfavorable view of Donald Trump. But yet one in five voters uh, vote in that same group voted for him anyway. Yeah. So what that tells me is a couple of things is one is, yeah, we need to kind of dispel this idea that this was all about race. Two, it tells me that similar to this idea of like well okay fine if it's not about race how could 50 percent of this country or at least the 50 percent that voted vote for an open unrepentant bigot racist xenophobe you know add on the well, add well on so, the, so this is what i mean when i talk about trump being the inverse and opposite of obama because because this is something that that you know President Obama talked about. He talked about it in his books. He talked about it in interviews how people would project their hopes and dreams onto him, mm-hmm. and so he mm-hmm. became a te- template uh, for a very wide swath of the electorate in that sense, right? right. And so right. we see in Trump that exact thing with a different swath of the electorate so people who wanted their you know who, who saw somebody who could fulfill their their financial dreams they saw they projected that onto him people who saw their their nativist dreams they projected that onto him. Do, do, does that make sense it does and in fact what's interesting is that if there ever were a candidate where you could project anything on it was donald trump because let's be real his policy yeah, he has no positions there, there was no substantive positions yeah. you know other than uh, appealing to I, I don't even know man i mean like his rhetoric right okay fine no no substantive policy positions but at the same time we can't deny 18 years of the demo uh, of the um the kind of demagoguery that we saw from Trump and the kind of statements that he made again and again and again and again. So what does that say? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, race and, and class are all kind of intermingled in yep. this election. And, and that's what the, uh, no, I think they're intermingled period. I think one can, you know what I mean? Yeah. You can't, they are, just sociologically, you know, they're inter- they're, they're 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 intertwined. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, I I think that the reality is, I mean, the sad reality is that these rust belt states that you know th- sort of turn to him, 
mm-hmm. because of his promise to bring jobs, manufacturing jobs back to the Midwest, are in for another disappointment. Oh, yeah. Because, because you know, the reality, the economic realities of this world are that those jobs are gone. They're gone. They're not coming back because the global, excuse me, the, 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 the global economy has changed. Right. So yeah, I mean they were essentially they were a quintess, they were told a quintessential political lie, which is that somehow you know all of those jobs were were, were going to be coming back to these ghost towns now in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and you know Ohio. It's just it's just not a reality. Yeah, and and so I mean, uh, but but you know what? I think another interesting point. I think that also again, not that. Not that we need to, because I think, like I said, the narrative has shifted. But um, that that dispels this notion that this was all about race. Counties that Obama did uh, did very well in places like Pennsylvania, which a state that he won, I believe Wisconsin, a state that he won, and I'm talking about 2008, not notwithstanding you know 2012, even 2008, the first time he ran. Uh, these are counties that voted for Obama. I mean, these are same. These are Obama voters or people who voted for Obama in 2008, and then in 2016, they could not bring themselves to vote for Hillary Clinton, regardless of their feelings towards Donald Trump. Well, and and I think it's worth. I think what's necessary here really is to separate President Obama from Hillary Clinton. Oh, absolutely, and in fact, I, 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 I def. There's a whole portion of the show and the podcast that I want to dedicate to just talking about HRC, like H- Hillary Rodden Clinton. Well, well, let, I mean, let's let's do that right now because because sure, sure. Uh, Can I say something that 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 may be controversial, that may, or perhaps it'll set the tone for the rest of the conversation around Hillary Con- Hillary Clinton, and that is that I I I have now or the conclusion I have reached is that Hillary Clinton is the singularly worst political candidate in American history. Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton. And the reason I say wow. that is because if a political – okay, if, if – it's like a political candidate's raison d'etre, like the very reason why a political candidate exists is to win an election. And Hillary Clinton is incapable of winning – I mean, okay, fine. She she served as a senator, so I can't deny I think the fact. She won that, twice as a senator. Fine, fine. You know, you're absolutely right. But to, the way she lost in 2008 to a to an unknown like Obama, right? In 2008, mind you, and the way in which she lost to Donald Trump. I mean, to me, there's a serious flaw in Hillary Clinton as a political candidate beyond perhaps the state of New York. Hmm. Huh. And also, I'm sorry, I think we also would be remiss not to talk about this, not only so much being a referendum or uh, – I, mean, I, I think by any stretch of the imagination, we, you know, this, the outcome of the election was not a referendum on Donald Trump, but rather it was a referendum on the Democratic, the Democratic Party and the Democratic establishment. And I think that you can't talk about Hillary well, Clinton. Well, but a, hold, hold on. Be, be, it, it, it was just as much a referendum on the Republican Party in terms of what happened during the primaries. That's a great point. And in fact, up until election night, I thought, you know what, that the that the end result, the the the, the sort of net result of this of this election was going to be the 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 end of the GOP as we knew it. Yeah. That that the GOP was going to fr- be this fractured party, you know, and but. I think what we're seeing more – or actually, we don't know if that's going to be the case or not because there's still – even though the Republicans secured or, or retained power in both, both, the, both houses uh, of Congress, I think that we still don't know what that relationship between Trump and the, and the Republican congressmen or, uh, congressman is going to be, right, or the Republican um, House and Senate is going to be. I think that any because there was a lot of acrimony there. No, the acrimony is done because because the Republicans will fall in line. I mean, I mean, let's be real here. Republicans, uh, uh, you know, Democrats fall in love. Republicans fall in line, <laughs> right? And 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 that's, that's a very 
point. And you know, in fact, I, like now, like again, so much post mortem going on. People who are it, it's it, it's coming out now that people like Republicans who are publicly dis, distancing themselves from Trump, yeah. like with his rhetoric and all, were in fact behind closed doors and in secret when they saw that the polls were still not dispositive of the fact that Trump was going to get swept. Um, that they were, you know, making secret like gestures towards Trump and the the the, the Trump campaign, trying to secure spots and and you know uh, carry favor. Yeah, I mean, any any notion of a fractured Republican Party is just wishful thinking. The reality is that in 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 every possible permutation. This is the nightmare scenario if you are somebody who cares about, you know, progressive policies and, and you know, a, a, a big chunk of what was accomplished during the last eight years. There's, there's no sugarcoating it. This is, this is a lot of bad news, and it's going to happen very, very quickly. When you say this is a lot of bad news, like, well, I'm sorry, what, what, do you, what, do you, what, what are you referring to? Well, I mean, the just right off the gate the the um deferred deportations and things that were put in place by president obama are 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 going to be gone ah right Those, right obamacare obamacare is already i mean just kiss it goodbye and it's really i mean i mean i'm i'm sitting here and i'm thinking about it's it's kind of extraordinary when you think about it because Day one, inauguration day, 2008, Mitch McConnell made it his mission to impede, yeah. impede President Obama at every step. Do not give him any policy wins, right? Obstruct, obstruct, obstruct. For eight years, this Correct. went on. And when you think about it, as a result of that obstruction, as, as a result of we're not even going to sit down and talk to you, President Obama was forced to enact whatever policy changes he could by, by, by executive order. And as a result of that, because it didn't have the force of law behind it, yeah. everything that he's accomplished. When we look at the 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 uh, how the majority of the Obama legacy will be wiped away, like it's like it's an expo marker on a whiteboard. It wow. is is real. I mean, it's yeah. sobering to think about. It is. It's, I, 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 hadn't even, I hadn't even thought about it. That, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, uh, the people who are going to be deported, uh, gun restrictions are going to be wiped away. The uh, clean energy. I mean, this isn't this isn't alarmism. I mean, this is fact. They've said it. I take them at their word that this is mm. what they're going to do. Uh, Paul Ryan today said uh, we're going to be privatizing Medicare. So hold on. Okay. So I, I we, we, I, I want to talk about all this stuff because this is like, okay, where do we go from, where, where do we go from here? Yeah. But I want to go back to, I think the conversation that we were having, which was around Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton. If, so, if, so, I mean, no, I really want to finish this sort of postmortem so, portion of the yeah, so, episode that we can look for. I, I think that, you know, the, the, there's going to be recrimination of, uh, from now until forever. Oh, it should have been Bernie Sanders. I, I'll be well, very honest and say I don't know that whether Bernie Sanders would have beat Trump either. I mean, that's that's an essential unknowable. It, it is, but I think what also needs to be stated at this point, uh, or a point that I wanted to also raise with you, which, which is that the, the, the Democratic establishment did everything in its power to ensure Hillary Clinton's nomination. Sure. And did everything in its power to make sure, and I mean, we know with with uh, Debbie uh, Westerman's, res you know, resigning uh, from the DNC chair, who, interestingly enough, like, l lest we forget, she was the campaign, man she was the he head of Clinton's campaign back in 2008, when they were doing everything in their power to, you know, to, to, to have her secure the nomination against Obama. So anyway, so there's a, there's a, there's a history there. But anyway, so... Well, she was a we surrogate. She wasn't the head of her campaign. She was, she was, uh, she was a surrogate for, for Hillary Clinton. She never served as head of the campaign. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. She was a surrogate. Uh, okay, that even if that's the case, I, I the, the the point that I was making was that the the, the DNC did everything it could um, to to secure the nomination for Hillary Clinton. Right. And again, depending on how much into the weeds you get and want to get, 
uh, with the kind of emails, like some of the emails that have been leaked via WikiLeaks, um, if they're if they're if, if we are to take those emails to be true, there was a lot of shady sort of you know behind closed doors deals going on between and I'm sorry between Hillary Clinton and the DNC and network of executives and people who are in the you know basically who are higher high enough in the food chain in terms of like the media where the narrative was going to be they were going to do everything in their power to not only ensure that Hillary Clinton secured the nomination on the democratic side but that that that, that they could find or they could select if you will a candidate um on the Republican side, that was a sure win for Hillary Clinton. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, again, I don't know if I don't know. See, now my thing is like, how much of this is like conspiracy theories, and how much of this is like fact? I don't know because you know, if 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 we say, well, those emails are suspect. I mean, we don't know. There's all this controversy around. Well, WikiLeaks releasing these and Russia hacking the email and so on and so forth, right? So we don't know, but. If 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 if, the, if we take the emails uh, to be dispositive of what really happened, then I think that again it's it's undeniable that there were these dealings going on to not only ensure the Hillary Clinton's nomination, but also what they call the Pied Piper effect yep. with regards to securing Donald Trump right. as being the the most viable Republican candidate that she could be. Yep. Do, do you agree with that? I mean, for, for one, I mean, do, do, do you think that there's there's some truth to there? I, I it's it's entirely. I mean, I, I read the same stuff you did. I, that it Got makes it. sense to me, you know. Yeah, it does. It does as well. You and, know, and and so so that's kind of like, you know, I mean, it bit him in the butt in a big bad way. Well, not just that. I mean, I don't care about it buying it biting them in the butt, to be honest with you, because then to me that's just, yeah. But it bit us all in the butt. That's the problem. Exactly. That to me that's just just just. I desserts. mean, you're, you're playing with but, fire, right? Because exactly. because exactly. I'm saying that the sheer lack of what's the word? Yeah, the, just the sheer. Uh, yeah, she just didn't care that that there was still this chance that 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 the nation, that the country, that all of us. Yeah. Would be would be left with a with, with a Trump presidency. Well, it didn't ever occur to them that he right. would win. Fine, right? Fine, fine, fine. Good point. And, and to be fair, it didn't occur to the overwhelming majority of us that he would lose. You know, I think Sorry. I I think the pr it didn't it didn't occur to us. Repeat that that he would lose that that he would that he would win. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. We, right. We, <laughs> I was like, sorry. I, I, yeah. I mean, we okay. took it as a given that he would. Yes. He would lose. And yes, we did. And th this is the thing. I mean, it, th there's a lot of like, oh, in in uh, in the benefit of hindsight, we can say this, that, and the other thing. But I mean, the truth is that uh, the the practical reality of President Trump. Every, it 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 we all felt it like like the when somebody does the wave at a at a ball game at like you know 8 p.m. on Tuesday night like that's when suddenly we started realizing that this was actually happening yeah i forgot exactly the exact moment when it when it began sinking in but yeah it I was mean, relatively for, early for to me, be honest with you for me i remember it was uh, so i, yeah, I yeah. was watching Please. i was watching the returns in florida and i was like this should not be this yeah. close and then once i saw so florida was still a fight and i was like florida was still a fight they called ohio for trump but before but before they called ohio uh he was he was ahead in michigan yes and i was like well see even when he was ahead in michigan i knew wayne county was still like there were still counting votes in wayne county which i know having lived there to be detroit and 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 the largest metropolitan area in michigan um so so I was still hopeful and but again it was at that point when, when I I think it was at that very moment where I said okay this election is going to come down to Wisconsin and Michigan like so goes Michigan and Wisconsin so goes the so goes the election what they often say about Ohio I didn't even imagine to be honest with you that Pennsylvania was up for grabs because I again looking at the exit polls earlier like the you know in the preceding days 
she had a comfortable lead in the polls in 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 Pennsylvania. Right. Now it, it had diminished from the uh, from the debate performances, but it was still relatively in a, a secure blue state. Uh, so I, you know, that, that that that's why for me it was like, okay, Wisconsin and Michigan are going to dictate the next, or are going to uh, elect the next president of the United States. Hmm. Uh, but then, yeah, Pennsylvania, and it was it was it was over. It was over. Yeah. So so going um, back to the 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 earlier point, I mean, yes, yes, I, you know, there, th- it was never a serious consideration that he would actually win. Okay. So, right. so, in that sense, not to say it's right necessarily, but you can understand the strategist's thinking because that was the conventional wisdom that if we run against this guy, it will win it in a walk. Right. And but and and they, by the way, the polling yeah. bore that out right up to near no, the end. You know. You're you're right. You're right. Um, but. Uh, to, to this idea of the sort of Pied Piper strategy, I think what they failed to realize, again, of course, what all the polls also failed to take into account was the fact that large swaths of, uh, again, the Rust Belt uh, working class white vote was not going to come out in favor of Hillary Clinton. Right. That was again that because that was the swath of the electorate that again essentially um, dictated the outcome of the election. That's right. At the end of the day, right? Non college educated, what what are what are again usually referred to as uh, working class uh, white folks. Right. Right. Uh, and I think so. Then so then. Real quick, then, in terms of your your what you feel, do you feel like then the real conversation or the real uh, schism, if you will, not to say that race isn't a factor, but if race is not the factor or the uh, the, uh, the 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 main factor to consider here, if we do identify as what is the main sort of schism or or or, uh, or cleavage in American society, is it between college educated and non college educated? I, I think so, but because because by large chunks, college educated whites, not only okay, those that did come out to vote, that was the other thing. College educated whites just didn't come out to vote in the numbers that they did for Obama. Right. But 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 again, those who did come out to vote did vote in favor of Hillary Clinton. Now, and again, an interesting statistic: six out of ten Americans, however, do not have a college degree. Six out of ten. I didn't know that. That's I, I, I didn't. I did, that's the really high number too. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, no, Washington Post. Uh, yeah, column. Uh, so I found that fascinating because I'm like that can only be that number. I don't see that number going up necessarily. I see that number just you know continue to either stay at stay where it is or go down or yeah, as as time passes. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that. You know, for 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 many families, right. college is not an option. And you know, if, if you're talking about working class, blue collar people, you know, it's not something that they need mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. In, well, in their day to day lives. Well, that would have been conventional wisdom 20 years ago. Like it, it goes back to the conversation around the global economy. The global economy has changed, man. That's the thing, right? But they can't but rely the glo- on those. But the global economy has left behind precisely those voters who. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Exactly, those non-college degree voters. Yeah, who who, uh, dis- who decided this election? Exactly, yeah. exactly my point. So it becomes this sort of like, yeah. I mean, so if if if. if because on the one hand, one can cite the changing demographics, the the, the changing ethnic, dem- you know, at the, the the ethnic makeup of the United States, the Browning effect that we talked about on that episode with with, with Shadi. But I think that what's what what, what another uh, factor that we can't fail to, or that we shouldn't fail to also take into account is 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 what ha- if 6 out of 10 Americans are are not college educated today what does that look like 20 years from now when yes white people might be a minority but 
are, are we are we looking at seven out of ten Americans not having college degrees? Because if that's more representative of where people vote according to cl- you know according to education and perhaps on a related note to to class than they do based on race alone. Right. Anyway, um, sorry. So going back, yeah. So you were saying, so yeah, you're right. The the DNC and Hillary, obviously the Hillary campaign did not, could not, did not fathom the idea that that Trump would, that the possibility that he would win. Yeah. So, so they the, took that gamble. They, f- they took that gamble by basically using, you know, rather than their house as collateral, the 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 future for the, 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 our, our country as collateral. That's right. To to, to, to play that. To stake that bet, yeah. Wow, you know, and and I mean, yeah, you know, when when you look at what when we when you look at what was on the ballot this election without actually being on the ballot, you can't help but really look at the future as, I mean, you can't help but sort of say Hillary Clinton lost the future. <laughs> Wow, you know, I mean, and and that's again, that's not hyperbole because I'm looking at the Supreme Court, yeah. and I'm looking at the fact that you have you have people in Congress who have made it their mission to unwind the social progress of the last several decades in, in to to an absurd degree, um, and they're 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 in position to do that. So when you talk about okay. I mean, just you name it. I mean, just it's it's it really boggles the mind. And and I think that's what really upsets me the most about this election is that they have played such dirty pool. You know, going back, yeah. you know, again, going back to the day Barack Obama was inaugurated and, yeah. and instead of being repudiated every like it, this is going to be the new normal, you know, the when when Scalia died. They dispensed with all precedent and said, "No, we're not going to give the yeah. sitting president the chance to do his job." And you know, they're being rewarded. Like Mitch McConnell's being called a genius for having done that. Yeah, and yeah. and that's you know, when you look at it, like who did who did President Obama put forward? See, this is what this is what I'm saying about the the way this game is played because President Obama did the thing that was expected. And every time he did, he was slapped down for that. Well, I mean, and, and this is a conversation I think, like, I want to have, which is if if this is a referendum on the Democratic Party, right, uh, and the Democratic establishment, then then I then I then then what are, what are the lessons learned? Because I think that one can't deny when we look at the eight years of the Obama administration that the first four, essentially, if not maybe even the first five or six were spent basically Obama still living under this delusion that he could reach across the aisle and he could have a conversation with, you know, at that time it was Boehner and, and, you know, uh, and, and, and Mitch McConnell. And I think that that not pursuing his own progressive agenda uh, and trying to uh, either reach across the aisle and then having to then present relatively centrist ideas uh, forward only to have them shot down even further or have them watered down, yeah. which, I mean, at the end of the day, Obamacare slash the Affordable Care Act yeah. isn't even – I mean, it's centrist, dude. It's, this is yeah, the, it's a, this it's is a the Republican health- policy. Thank you. It's a Republican policy from back during the Clinton administration. Yeah. Right? That the Republican Congress had come up with. I mean, it, was, it's, it, is, it is essentially that. And so, so that's my point. If this is a refer, it, it, or not my point, but this is perhaps the conversation I really want to have as well, which is that if this is a referendum on the DNC and the, and 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 the and the progressives or the left in this country, then what is the lesson learned? I think, to me at least, the lesson learned is that you know, forget trying to play dirty pool, like you said. You know, and push forward a truly progressive, left-leaning agenda, and you know, at least put your stake. You know, you know, uh, play it that way as opposed to taking safe positions. Well, I mean, I think I think one thing you can say about about President Obama is he 
he was somebody, he is somebody who believes in the institution. And I think by that in the institution of the institution of government and having come from the, he, having come from the Senate, he was okay. aware of the fact that it was meant to be a collaborative role. I mean, the, the, the you know, the founders made sure that not a lot of power exides in the executive. Right. And, and this is it's not like this has been an, an imperial presidency. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. That being yeah. that being well, said, yeah. I mean, unless you unless you listen to right wing radio, but yeah, yeah okay. Well, I mean, the unfortunate thing, honestly, is one area where the executive had a lot of authority during this administration was as it pertains to the surveillance state and things like that, and that's all being handed over to Donald Trump. So if if wow. if you're not terrified by that idea, you have not read his Twitter feed ever, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, we're kind of joking, but I mean, when you really no, no, you're that... right, no, 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 I, exactly. And we can't see. That's the thing. I think that, and this is again one of those things that you know, I, and the list of things that I had that I wanted to talk to you about was this, like, you know, I, what I fear is that the media is going to do this sort of normalizing of of Donald Trump. It's, almost it's because happening it's already. Ha- it's it's it's, it's done already. deal. Not going to. They I, they are and they will. Thank you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and that's scary because at the end of the day, though, we're, 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 even if we look at the fact that, like, fine, there's been a shift in the narrative in terms of, oh, all of Donald Trump's supporters were a basket of deplorables who were racist and xenophobic and, and sexist and so on. That, that we know now that that's not, those aren't, the, those aren't exclusively the people that put him in power. However, the man repa- the man re- remains an unrepentant racist sexist xenophobe demagogue who has very little learn who has a, who has the attention span of a gnat and has very little in- a very little interest in actual governance or learning things like as i think someone said man probably hasn't read a book in his adult life yeah right that isn't the art of the deal or whatever yeah uh, so that's a scary prop yeah that is a scary proposition it, it is you know and and i mean th- there's there's no way that's there, there's no way around the fact that the next few years are going to be really rough yeah. uh, in in so far as you know if if you again like i said earlier if if you care about certain policies and and a, a, a somewhat progressive agenda i mean th- these are not going to be good times Mm-mm. now now Mm-mm. that's not i i want to be very clear about this i'm not saying woe is me i'm saying we have an election in two years so we'd better get our act together and get activated there's an election in four years we'd better get our act together and get activated i mean this is this is not the time for for you know stagnation or depression it's okay let's yeah. get to work i mean that's you know I, I said this earlier tonight in my class i said look anything uh worth having is worth fighting for and and you fight for things because they're difficult not because they're easy that's right that's right i mean what yeah i i keep you know uh, i forget you know someone someone po- like someone reminded me of this and then it's just sort of now been sort of my kind of mantra like the web one of my coping mechanisms you know is you know um something martin luther king said mm-hmm. which is you know like the arc of the moral universe is long uh, but it te- but it bends towards justice so yeah we're going to have a rough four years but you know in the end hope you know you 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 believe at least that that, that that somehow the universe has well, a way and, of rectifying. And, and another and, and, another and, quote by Martin Luther King is, you know, change doesn't roll in on the wheels of inevitability. Thank you. Know, you. That's a beautiful. It only comes point. through right. constant struggle. Yeah. And, and yeah. the reality yeah. is that this is the time. If we're talking about the Muslim community in this country, this is our time to make meaningful alliances with other communities. And be a, be yeah. be true allies to each other, and that means honestly, that means reaching out to the LGBT community. That means mm-hmm. the, uh, the Hispanic community. That means the the, the black community, uh, Jewish community. Jewish community, um, yeah. Uh, Who's 
I mean, who's been an ally through and throughout, like, I mean, almost, you know, repudiating everything that Donald Trump had to say, you know, uh, one of the one, one of the one of the groups always repudiating uh, Donald Trump uh, for his uh, sort of xenophobic remarks was the Anti-Defamation the ADL, League. Yeah. And they've been yeah. warned by the the yeah. Jewish uh, Republican <laughs> groups to, to kind of mind themselves. I mean, look, the... the 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 fact of the matter is that we've got work to do. Yeah, yeah. And no, no, we're already seeing this, and I, I think we, should, we it's worth talking about. But you know, in the in the in the days since the election, which what we're in November, like you said, we're recording this on November tenth. But there's been several several reports of you know uh, racist comments and. Uh, you know, Muslim students being attacked and and and, and so on. And, and media Hispanics and, and yeah, and homosexuals. That's right. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I mean, right. what so, we're seeing is the revolt by uh -huh. again some of those who who have seen their you know seen the changes in this country and and oh. and are terrified of it. Okay, fine, but. What to me, but okay, but you know what? That would the, your argument would have made more sense to me even a week ago. But now, I feel as though with with his with with, with Donald Trump's victory uh, and winning the election, it's it's now that those same people are now emboldened. Yeah, because because and that's the scary part to yeah, me. Yeah, well, right? and I'll tell you why. Because because one thing I said all along is I'm not scared as much about what president trump will or won't do although i that is a concern obviously um yeah as i, I what was always more worrisome to me was what he gave other people cover to do right because right. from now on people can say well i'm just doing i what i'm doing is no worse than what president trump did or does or says or says Right. And grab them. You know, yeah. Grab them. But yeah. Yeah. You know, right. So, right. so this is, I mean, mm. Uh, mm. Th that's, that's where we're at, where, you know, the, Oh yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just reminded in this context. I mean, I think one, one uh, segment, at least of the population or the electorate that we haven't talked about. And I, I say for good or, you know, uh, good riddance is the, the influence of the Christian right. What do you what do you make of that? Like in terms of the fact that they were still supporting Donald Trump in spite of his indiscretions, in spite of, you know what I mean? Like the big and what happens to them as a as a political uh, force? Well, I mean, they supported him, so nothing happens to them. They remain viable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the thing. See, I, I think so there's no like okay, you know, they lose like Trump loses the election, they have egg on their face, and they go home. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think people don't realize how much truly was on the line during this election. Because yeah, because I mean, again, to this... quote our our former guest, I mean, Shaddy, who I think he wrote about it afterwards in the in the monthly in the in the Atlantic Monthly, uh, a piece where he he sort of called this election the uh, kind of one of those existential yeah. and, elections, and that's not an exaggeration. History. Yeah, he, you know, yeah. because because. Had Donald Trump lost, it would have been, in essence, the death knell of the Republican Party as it existed. So mm. this was the moment. This was the moment where Isildur could have thrown the ring into the fires and ended the threat. Hmm. I just went, yeah. I just went yeah. super Lord of the Rings nerd on you. <laughs> <laughs> to the point where you uh, even lost me. So, well, if you remember in 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 Lord of the Rings, right? I Isildur was, you know, he the, bro the oh, a seal door. You said, yeah. I, I swear to God, I thought I I was like, what is a seal's door? Like, I was thinking you were making this analogy oh. to like a seal and a door. No, no. it's seal door, right? The 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 son of a the king. Door. That's right. Right. But go ahead for the sake of our listeners. He he had the opportunity like all he had to do to stop the threat of Sauron, he had the ring in his hand, all he had to do was drop it into the fire. But he didn't. Because, you know, Avarice and whatnot got a hold of him and he didn't do it. And so as a result, you know, the the threat remained. I mean now obviously this is slightly hyperbolic, but I mean 
what we desperately need was, was a a reformation of some kind of, of sort of Republican orthodoxy. What's going to happen now is instead, which I think is also needed, is a reformation of, of democratic orthodoxy. Which I'm fine. Yeah. I, I welcome. I, that's but, totally fine. Uh, but I, I just wish it wasn't at, yeah, in this context. In this context, where so much is on the so line. Much is on the line. And, and, you know, I, a friend of mine put this on Twitter. I can't take credit for it, but it's, you know, you have the people who are saying everything will be fine. And the people yeah. who are saying that are the ones for whom everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, right. And, I... Right, and and it's like there are there are communities that will be suffering under this administration. There's no two ways around it. People who are impoverished, people of color, people. I mean, it's it's going. To... No, no, absolutely. I think. The definition of white privilege now is the fact that you have nothing to fear under, you, you know, like you, you had nothing to fear before yeah. and you have nothing to fear now under a Trump administration. Yeah, you, know. Like, you know, it's like to me, like I think Hassan bin Hodges segment from yesterday or something from last night on the Daily Show where he's like, you know, my, my mom calls me and she's visiting my grandmother, I assume, back in India or Pakistan. And, you know, he's saying, you know, his mom wants to extend her trip to February and, you know, he and she's like, I hope I can come back to the country. And, and you know, Hassan Minhaj is like, I, I can't tell her definitively that, yeah, everything will be fine and, 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 and I'll see you in February. Right. I mean, that's a real prospect, people, for a lot of our fellow Americans, right. whether again, whether you're Muslim or not. I mean, like you said, Latinos, African-Americans. And so on, uh, you know, are, are, are people uh, are homosexual and in, in, in gay lifestyle folks. Like, is this a real? This is a real issue uh, or a real threat yeah. that people uh, are. And you know, I imagine you as well, Zeki. I mean, knowing people um, through your Facebook feed or just personally, even who had to have really uncomfortable conversations with their kids as Muslims. I'm saying. Yeah. Like I know a lot of children. My my kids were livid and upset and crying almost, and just couldn't believe it. Yeah, um, yeah, man, it's it's real. It's not just yeah. It's it, this is unlike anything we've seen. It's unprecedented. I mean, the one thing I've been telling my students is the the hadith about if the end of the world comes and you're planting a tree. You finish, you keep finish, finish planting yeah. it, and and you know that's. I've been saying again. I've been saying that in my classes because I'm seeing a level of despondency, and I'm trying to really get people focused, like saying, "Look, you're not helping anybody." Yeah, yeah. Like, so I think, so I think we're not helping ourselves either. Then by commiserating, so I, I it, why don't we shift the conversation and perhaps maybe end or conclude on. Where, where do we go from here? So, like now, I know we've done a lot of talking about, and now we're kind of we've shifted the conversation to talking about, you know, uh, groups that are almost singularly affected by a, a Trump administration. But focusing, if you will, specifically for the Muslim community, like w where do we go from here? Like, I mean, look, the, the reality is this: that. God forbid the next time some kind of event happens related uh -huh. to Muslims. Yeah. And I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's, something's going to happen at some point, whether it's a domestic thing or what, somewhere overseas, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, the reaction by the government will be very, very different than it's been mm. at any point since 9-11. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, we need to be sober about the fact that if we thought the government was heavy handed during the George W. Bush administration, well, I mean, th there's a new sheriff in town. That's right. You know, that's and, right. and I mean, that's something we really need to think about because because yeah. George W. Bush was front and center <clears throat> saying, look, Islam is, is peace. And, and, you know, he yeah. he was sort of keeping the, the dog on the leash, so to speak. 
No, absolutely. Inviting, you know, invi- inviting interfaith leaders. I mean, he invited Sheikh Hamza to the White House to 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 to, to speak with him, to to counsel him about Islam and about how to deal and interact with the Muslim community. Within one week, he was at a mosque yeah. in D.C. Ain't, ain't, I mean, no, ain't no Eid the reception happening under President Trump. I'm glad I got in while the getting was good. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. I mean, wow. I mean, and, and you know, to, and, and, to, I mean, to your point then about the stark, how I forgot how you phrase it exactly, but you know, this being the complete uh, antithesis of the Obama, you know, Obama like ele- election in 2008. Yeah. I mean, we're looking at that not only in terms of how the election took place and, and the attitude and the sort of uh, the emotional tenor of the nation, but also think of. Like how how contrasting an Obama administration is going to be to a Trump administration. Yeah. Again, not to say that every you know that that Obama did everything right and that and the, that the uh, and that the administration was perfect, but um, you know taking issue with Obama's drone policy or domestic policies now almost seems like a like a luxury. Yeah. You know, I mean, because now we're talking about our very, like you said, like, like again, in the, you know, quoting Shadi and stuff, like, our, it's an ex, this is, a, we're talking existential now. Yeah. And, right? and I mean, you know, the, the, we, we have a pretty good idea of the hand, the, the way this administration is going to be dealing with the Muslim community. How do we know this? Because of who he has as advisors, Waleed Faris, uh, John Bolton, he's saying he's going to be secretary of state. I mean, this is, this is, these people are on the record, you know, and, and I, I'm of the mindset that when somebody tells you who they are, you believe them. That's right. Uh, yeah. I, I've heard that time and time again. Like, I mean, we can only take Donald Trump at his word. I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so I mean, especially for a per, especially for a candidate who is literally run only on his words, meaning like only on what he has said. Because, in terms of substantive policy positions, he has stated none. Or in the course of the last ten years, has flip flopped so many times that he's held every single position on every practically every single issue. Right. So, what we can do then is take him on his word when he says, "A, hey, you know." Uh, register mandatory registry for Muslims. Right. I'm going to, you know, st- uh, you know, no more Muslim um, immigrating, you know, immig- uh, entering the United States. A ban on Muslims entering the United States, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Building that wall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so a lot of this stuff. So again, th- this goes to what I was saying earlier. So yeah. so we yeah. need to, uh, you know. Uh, you know, make hay while the sun is out or whatever the hell the f- phrase is. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, now is the time to yeah. get activated again. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we have a, we've, we've seen in the last 16 years, 15 years, let's say since nine 11, you and I, we've seen the prominence of Muslims in the public eye grow and grow. Yeah. Right. right. And, and, you know, I feel like old uncle guy now because all these young kids are doing this stuff now, you know? No, absolutely. And, I mean, you were there at the White House. I mean, you, you saw some of those in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the corridors of power, yeah, as it were. Yeah, you know, and, and, and so... To me, Huma, like, there are many Huma Abedins. Sure. You know, some... Yeah, exactly. Sorry, go on. No, so, so I mean, the, the broader point I'm making is now is the time to get to work because of whenever something inevitably happens and there will be a backlash suddenly like the same backlash there's always been suddenly now there is a government that is friendly to that backlash backlash mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right and yeah. and again i want to be very clear that i'm not trying to sound like an alarmist because no, be, what, no, I, what i am I mean, saying is this is what we know and that's right. We, I mean, it, for me, it's like to quote Tavis Smiley, um, you know, I, I, I'm not an optimist, but I'm a slave to hope. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not the eternal optimist, but I can hope that, like you said, we can build a coalition. We can, you know, we can work towards coalition building. We can we can identify and build relationships with our allies. Um, I think that's that's extremely important. For this, for for the for, for the Muslim community, I also want this to be perhaps a lesson um, 
that we need to – I think we still need to grow and, and mature politically. And by that I mean – you know, let's not forget, I mean, in the year 2000, 70 percent of registered Muslims voted uh, for, you know, were, I'm sorry, 20, 70 percent of, of Muslims that voted in that election voted Republican. Right. And were perhaps even, I don't know, you know, uh, identified Republicans. Um, uh, but we saw obviously a shift of that and that a lot of that has to do with the eight years of the Bush administration. But we can't, I don't. I mean, to me, that still represents, at least in political years, I mean, that's still relatively being fickle-minded, right? Yeah. You, where well, I, you just see where the wind is blowing, and you it, it's political expediency. I mean, I, I think there's a fascinating research study to be done sure. about the, sh the 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 way the muslim vote shifted because i think oh yeah if i were to, i mean certainly in the in the in the 80s and 90s i i would assume i don't have the numbers in front of me but the majority of muslims i, I voted as or identified as republican those who did vote and oh you're absolutely i, I think and partly again, because of social back, conservatism right oh yeah. yeah oh yeah you know yeah and and that ended up being to our detriment arguably because you know uh, social policy should, uh, you know, we as Muslims should be should be voting for an open and inclusive social policy, that's because right. that's, that's what will benefit us. But see, again, that's what I mean when I say maturation. Like to even think that way uh, is reflective of a certain maturity, because again, a a an, a a, a uh, juvenile or infantile approach to social issues is to again simply say well oh uh, you know we don't you know islam doesn't allow abortions and uh we are pro-life and and hence you know uh or whatever other various and sundry social issues there are we we feel that religion should have a space a place in 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 in, in public in, in 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 public life uh and automatically align ourselves with republicans simply by virtue of those social issues not seeing the sort of bigger picture and the broader sort of contours of how those issues play out. Yeah. Uh, because like while – so for example, take for example abortion. Uh, yes, Islamic law doesn't allow abortion unless the, you know, unless the health of the mother and, and there's various uh, exceptions to that rule. But as a general rule, abortion is, uh, is, is, is not allowed. It's not permissible in Islamic law. However – that is a far cry from criminalizing abortions, right. you see. So, for example, yes, going back to your very, very – right at the outset of the, of, of the show, you said, well, what is the FIC position on marijuana smoking? There's a difference between saying smoking marijuana is impermissible or consuming alcohol is impermissible, and there's a difference between stating that as a position – than saying that that type of behavior or uh, in this case smoking marijuana or drinking alcohol should be criminalized see that's the difference yeah. so i would argue that yes we have our we have uh, a certain uh you know we have uh, our own parameters around these issues moral parameters around these issues however uh at least in my opinion uh, Islamic law uh, is very careful when it comes to criminalizing these types of things, yeah. especially for a community that is living as a minority Muslim community in a – you know what I mean? Like right where, where Islamic law is not the law of the land uh, and so on. So I, I hope that makes sense. It absolutely does. Yeah. So you're right. I mean but again, my point being that yes, it's time that we mature politically. Well – Now's the time. No, no time like yeah, the present, right. you know? That's right. That's right. Oh, wow. So What a, what a conversation, uh, huh? I yeah, man, it breezed by. I don't I, I don't know. Uh, I think have we crossed the hour mark? We have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, again, I mean, I, I you know, frankly at this point I I know we always say this, but I really like I'd really love to hear from our listeners. Um so yeah, please do chime in. Um Participate in the conversation by sending us an email, right? We'd love to hear from you, really, at this time. If in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, Zucky and I are, you know, we're, 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 we're pretty smart guys, but we don't have all the answers. So, uh, you know, if there's any policy wonks out there, I think it would it would behoove uh, the conversation 
um, and future episodes for us to 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 to, to share your thoughts. So please do send those in. Uh, oh, oh, and I and I've you know I've met a couple of these unicorns, but if you if you're a Muslim and you wholeheartedly and with full I don't know, with full pride and transparency, voted for Donald Trump. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear why you felt that uh, Donald Trump was the best candidate. Yeah, S- send us your <laughs> send us your thoughts. <laughs> right, right. Um, all right. Well, uh, yeah. Again, uh, Zucky, always a pleasure. And uh, I know, like I like uh, we've read time and time again, our listeners like to hear this episode where or these type of episodes where the two of us just ruminate on things and i think that the election um was certainly this was a ruminable election <laughs> it was certainly yeah it was certainly uh an opportunity to 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 uh to, to to do so definitely i'm curious if this if this ep- if this was an episode that we gave a number to um is it are we on episode 45 i'm just i'm sorry i'm really bad i uh what are, what are we on? We're on something. We're 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 well. Uh, we're on pot because it's legal now. So <laughs> no, I, uh, the reason I asked that is because, of course, Donald Trump is what the forty fifth president. This is, right? this, is so. this is oh my god, yeah, uh, episode forty three. Ah, oh, shucks. Yeah. I thought it would just be yeah because I, I felt like that would just be more, that would have been yeah. huge. <laughs> Right, right. Oh, what does this do for st- what does this do for uh, late night comedy? Oh, speaking of late night comedy, um, I, I don't know about you, and I know you're an SNL fan, but I you got I mean, I haven't watched SNL in probably besides segments or clips that I've watched in years. But I can you can bet your dollar that I'm watching this Saturday, man. Yeah, so, well, this, uh, I'm you know Alec Baldwin's not sticking around indefinitely, so they need to find a new Trump now that uh, the. The, the, you know. Well, there's that, but I mean, I, I'm sorry. I meant specifically the fact that Dave Chappelle is uh, is, is is hosting. Oh, right. and yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, and and, and I'm sorry, but uh, again, I'm a I'm a I'm a product of the '90s. But a tribe called Quest is performing. Right. So this was announced way before the results of the election. So uh, you know, I, I've been excited since they announced it, but now even more so because I I mean. Who who doesn't want to hear from David? You know Dave Chappelle right about now about this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, about this. Exactly, exactly. Because I don't know if you saw this, but a couple of weeks ago there was a clip of of a stand up comedy performance where he was less than favorable or said less than favorable things about Hillary. You know Hillary Clinton. Right. Um, and I believe there was a lot of sort of people on the right who sort of took that as an endorsement of Trump to the point where I saw this like TMZ clip where like they asked Dave Chappelle if he's pro Trump. Yeah, and he said no, <laughs> and he was like. Hell no! Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if I can quote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, definitely looking forward to uh, this weekend's SNL on November twelfth. So, um, anyway, uh, where can people find us, Zucky? I know we said they can email us, but where? Well, uh, you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail dot com. You can also hit like on our Facebook page, facebook dot com slash diffusecongruence. Also, uh, hit up iTunes and Stitcher Radio. You can go to iTunes and leave us a star rating, leave us a review, let people know how you're doing, let us know how we're doing, and uh, uh, every little bit helps. So please make that happen. And yes, and a special plug for Zucky as well. I mean, so you know, obviously people can 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 reach you on Twitter far far more easily than they can reach me, and we'll just leave it at that. But also, uh, you recently published a piece on Huffington Post, which I think, uh, you know, um, it, it's something definitely people should check out. And it's probably a great little uh, abstract of what we talked about today. So that, well, what is it called on HuffPo? It's called uh, President Trump and the Edge of the Abyss. There you go. <laughs> a more apt title I couldn't think of. Yeah, so, I, think, um, I think if you if you Google my name and Donald Trump, that should come up. <laughs> President Trump or something, you know. Let's hope that that's the only thing that comes up when you Google Zeki Hassan and yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm rolling the Donald dice. That <laughs> you are, <laughs> you are. Uh, no, I'm joking. But uh, yeah, definitely check out that piece. It, it, was, it was worth reading. And of course, uh, he also blogs on zekiscorner.com. You can check out his political, at times political ruminations as well. In addition to his movie reviews, so definitely check that out. Well, thank you. And thank you for listening, folks. We'll see you next time on Did You Use Convenience?